everybody, I'm going to read Divergent. I'm going to, because it's quite a long book, I'm going to read a chapter a day. This book is about B. Pryor and she's on the brink of a decision that will change her life. In society that is divided into factions, all are forced to choose where they belong and she's got to make a choice. Chapter one. There is one mirror in my house. It is behind a sliding panel in the hallway upstairs. Our factions allow me to stand in front of it on the second day of every third month, the day my mother cuts my hair. I sit on the stool and my mother stands behind me with the scissors trimming. The strands fall on the floor in a dull blonde ring. When she finishes, she pulls my hair away from my face and twists, twists it into a knot. I know how calm she looks and how focused she is. She is well practiced in the art of losing herself. I can't say the same for myself. I sneak a look at my reflection. And when she isn't paying any attention, not for the sake of vanity, but out of curiosity, a lot can happen to a person's appearance in three months. In my reflection, I see a narrow face, wide round eyes, a long thin nose. I still look at a little girl, though sometimes in the last few months, I turn 16. The only, the other factions celebrate birthdays, but we don't, it would be self-indulgent. There, she says, when she pins the knot into place, her eyes catch mine in the mirror. It's too late to look away, but instead of scolding me, she smiles at our reflection. I frown a little. Why doesn't she reprimand me for staring at myself? So today's the day, she says. Yes, I reply. Are you nervous? I stare into my own eyes for a moment. Today is the day of the aptitude test that will show me which of my five factions I belong. And tomorrow, at the choosing ceremony, I will decide on a faction. I will decide the rest of my life. I will decide to stay with my family or abandon them. No, I say. The tests don't have to change our choices. Right, she smiled. Let's go to eat breakfast. Thank you for cutting my hair. She kisses my cheek and slides the panel over the mirror. I think my mother could be beautiful in a different world. Her body is thin behind the grey robe. She has high cheekbones and long eyelashes. And when she lets her hair down at night, it hangs in waves over her shoulders. But she must hide that beauty away in Abenegnon. We walk together to the kitchen. On these mornings when my brother makes breakfast and my father's hand skims my hair, as he reads the newspaper and my mother hums as she clears the table. It is on these mornings that I feel guiltiest for wanting to leave them. The bus stinks of exhaust. Every time it hits a patch of uneven pavement, it jolts me from side to side, even though I'm gripping the seat to keep myself calm. My brother, Caleb, stands in the aisle, holding a railing above his head to keep him steady. We don't look alike. He has my father's dark hair and hooked nose and my mother's green eyes and dimpled cheeks. When he was younger, that collection of features looked strange, but now it suits him. If he wasn't in Abenegnon, I'm sure the girls at school would stare at him. He also inherited my mother's talent for selflessness. He gave his seat to Surly Candleman on the bus without a second thought. The Candleman wears a black suit with a white tie. Candor standard uniform. Their faction values honesty and sees truth as black and white, and that is what they wear. The gaps between the buildings narrow and the roads are smoother as we near the heart of the city. The building that was once called the Sears Towers, we call it the Hub, emerges from the fog, a black pillar in the skyline. The bus passes under the elevated tracks. I have never been on a train. That they stop running, that they never stop running, and there are tracks 
everywhere. Only the Dauntless ride them. Five years ago, volunteer construction workers from Ebon Negnon repaved some of the roads. They started in the middle of the city and worked their way onward until they ran out of materials. The roads where I live are still cracked and patchy and it's not safe to drive on them. We don't have a car anyway. Caleb's expression is placid as the bus sways and jolts on the road. The grey robe falls from his arms as he clutches a pole for balance. I can tell by the constant shift of his eyes that he is watching the people around us, striving to see only them and to forget himself. Candor values honesty, but our faction values selflessness. The bus stop in front of the school and I get up, scooting past the candor man. I grab Caleb's arm as I stumble over the man's shoes. My trousers are too long and I've never been that graceful. The upper level buildings is the oldest of the three schools in the city. Lower levels, middle levels and upper levels. Like all the buildings around it, it is made of glass and steel. In front of a large metal sculpture that the dauntless climb after school, daring each other to go higher and higher, last year I watched one of them fall and break a leg. I was the one who ran to get the nurse. Aptitude tests today, I say. Caleb is not quite a year older than I am, so we are in the same year at school. He nods as we pass through the front door. My muscles tighten the second we walk in. The atmosphere feels hungry, like every 16 year old is trying to devour as much as they can get out of their last day. It's likely that we'll not walk these halls again after the choosing ceremony. Once we choose, our factions will be responsible for finishing our education. Our classes are cut in half today, so we will attend all of them before the aptitude test, which take place after lunch. My heart rate is already elevated. You aren't at all worried what they'll tell you, I ask Caleb. We pause at the split in the hallway where he will go one way towards advanced math and I will go the other towards faction history. He raises an eyebrow at me. Are you? I could tell him I've been worried for weeks about what the aptitude test will tell me. Which faction will I be in? Candor, Erdude, Amity or Dauntless? Instead I smile and say, not really. He smiles back. Ah, have a good day. I walk towards faction history, chewing on my lower lip. He never answered my question. The hallways are cramped, though the light coming through the window creates the illusion of space. There are one of only places where the faction mix at our age. Today, the crowd is a new kind of energy, a last day mania. A girl with long curly hair shouts, hey! next to my ear, waving at a distant friend. A jacket sleeve smacks me on the cheek. Then a boy in a blue sweater shoves me. I lose my balance and fall on the ground. Out of my way, stiff, he snaps and continues down the hallway. My cheeks warm, I get up and dust myself off. A few people stopped when I fell, but none of them offered to help me. Their eyes follow me to the edge of the hallway. This sort of thing, has been happening to others in my faction for months now. They have been releasing reports about people like us and it has begun to affect the way we relate at school. The grey clothes, the plain hairstyle, the unassuming demeanour of my faction are supposed to make it easier for me to forget myself and easier for everyone else to forget me too. But now they make me a target. I pause by the window in E-Wing and wait for the dauntless to arrive. I do this every morning at exactly 7.25. The dauntless prove their bravery by jumping from a moving train. My father calls the dauntless Hellions. They are pierced tattoos in black clothes. Their primary purpose is to guard the fence that surrounds our city. From what? I don't know. They should perplex me. I should wonder what courage which is the virtue they most value, has to do with a metal ring through their nostril. Instead, my eyes cling to them wherever they go. The train whistle blares, the sound resonating in my chest. The 
light fixed at the front of the train clicks on and off as the train hurtles past the school, squealing on iron rings and as the last few cars pass, a mass exodus of young men and women in dark clothing hurl them themselves from the moving trains, some dropping and rolling, others stumbling a few steps before regaining their balance, whilst the boys wrap his arms around the girl's shoulders. Watching them is a foolish practice. I turn away from the window and press through the crowd to the faction history classroom. And that's the end of chapter one. Join me next time for chapter two. Chapter two. The test begin after lunch. We sit at the long tables in the cafeteria and the test administrator is called 10 names at a time, one each for the testing rooms. I sit next to Caleb and across from our neighbour Susan. Susan's father travels throughout the city for his job, so he has a car and drives her to and from school every day. He offered to drive us too, but as Caleb says, we prefer to leave later and would not want to inconvenience him. Of course not. The test administrators are mostly abnegation volunteers. Although there is an erudite in one of the testing rooms and dauntless in another to test those of us from abnegation because the rules state that we can't be tested by someone of our own faction. The rules also say that we can't prepare for the test in any way, so I don't know what to expect. My gaze drifts from Susan to dauntless tables across the room. They're laughing and shouting and playing cards. At another of the tables, the erudite chatter over books and newspapers in constant pursuit of knowledge. A group of amateur girls in yellow and red sit in a circle on the cafeteria floor, playing some kind of hand-snapping game involving a rhyming song. Every few minutes I hear a chorus of laughter from them as someone is eliminated and has to sit in the centre of the circle. At the table next to them, candle boys make wide gestures with their hands. They appear to be arguing about something, but it must not be serious because some of them are still smiling. At the abnegation table, we sit quietly and wait. Faction customs dictate even idle behaviour and supersede individual preference. I doubt, I doubt all the erudite want to study all the time, or even the candor enjoy a lively debate, but they can't divide the norms of their factions any more than I can. Caleb's name is called next. He moves confidently towards the exit. I don't need to wish him luck or assure him that he shouldn't be nervous. He knows where he belongs, and as far as I know, he always has. My earliest memory of him is from when he was four years old. He scolded me for not giving my jump rope to a little girl on the playground who didn't have anything to play with. He doesn't lecture me often anymore, but I have his look of disapproval memorised. I tried to explain to him that my instincts are not the same as his. It didn't even enter my mind to give the seat to the candle man on the bus, but he doesn't understand. Just do what you're supposed to, he always says. It's that easy for him. It should be that easy for me. My stomach wrenches. I close my eyes and keep them closed until 10 minutes later when Caleb sits down again. He's plaster pale. He pushes his palms along his legs like I do when I wipe off sweat. And when he brings them back, his fingers shake. I open my mouth to ask him something, but the words don't come. I'm not allowed to ask him about his results, and he's not allowed to tell me. An abnegation volunteer speaks the next round of names. Two from Dauntless, two from Erudite, two from Amity, two from Candor, and then from Abnegation, Susan Black and Beatrice Pryor. I get up because I'm supposed to, but if it were up to me, I would stay in my seat for the rest of time. I feel like there is a bubble in my chest that expands more by the second, threatening to break me apart from the inside. I follow Susan to the exit. The people I pass can't tell us apart. We wear the same clothes. We wear our blonde hair the same way. 
The only difference is that Susan might not feel like she's going to throw up. And from what I can tell, her hands aren't shaking so hard, she has to clutch the hem of her shirt to steady them. Waiting for us outside the cafeteria is a row of ten rooms. They're all used for the aptitude tests, so I've never been in one before. Unlike the other rooms in the school, they're separated, not by glass, but by mirrors. I watch myself, pale and terrified, walking to one of the doors. Susan grins nervously at me as she walks into room five and I walk into room six where a dauntless woman waits for me. She's not as severe looking as the young dauntless I've seen. She's small, dark, angular eyes and wears a black blazer like a man's suit and jeans. It's only when she turns to close the door that I see the tattoo on the back of her neck, a black and white hawk with a red eye. If I didn't feel like my heart would migrate to my throat, I'd ask her what it signifies. It must mean something. Mirrors cover the inner walls of the room. I can see my reflection from all angles, the grey fabric, fabric obscuring the shape of my back, my long neck, my knobbly knuckled hands, red with blood rush. The ceiling grows white with light. In the centre of the room is a reclined chair, like a dentist's with a machine next to it. It looks like a place where terrible things happen. Don't worry, the woman says. It doesn't hurt. Her hair is black and straight, but in the light I can see that it's streaked with grey. Have a seat and get comfortable, she says. My name is Tori. Clumsily I sit in the chair and recline, putting my head on the headrest. The light hurts my eyes. Tori, Busy herself with the machine on my right. I try to focus and not on the wires in her hand. Why the hawk? I blurt out as she attaches an electrode to my head. Never met a curious abnegation before, she says, raising an eyebrow at me. I shiver and goosebumps appear on my arms. My curiosity is a mistake, a betrayal of abnegation values. Humming a little, she presses another electrode to my forehead and explains. In some parts of the ancient world, the hawk symbolises the sun. Back when I got this, I figured I'd always have the sun on me. I wouldn't be afraid of the dark. I tried to stop myself asking another question, but I can't help it. You're afraid of the dark? I was afraid of the dark, she corrects me. She presses the next electrode onto my forehead and attaches a wire to it. She shrugs. Now, it reminds me of fear I've overcome. She stands behind me. I squeeze the armrest so tightly the redness pulls away from my knuckles. She tugs wires towards her, attaching them to me, to her, to the machine behind her. Then she passes me a vial of clear liquid. Drink this, she says. What is it? My throat feels swollen. I swallow hard. What's going to happen? Can't tell you that. Just trust me. I press air from my lungs and tip the contents of the vial into my mouth. My eyes close. When they open, an instant has passed. But I'm somewhere else. I stand in the school cafeteria again, but all the long tables are empty. And I see, through the glass walls, that it's snowing. On the table in front of me are two baskets, one with a hunk of cheese and the other with a knife the length of my forearm. Behind me a woman's voice says, Choose. Why? I ask. Choose, she repeats. I look over my shoulder but no one is there. I turn back to the baskets. What will I do with them? Choose, she yells. When she screams at me, my fear disappears and stubbornness replaces it. I scowl and cross my arms. Have it your way, she says. The baskets disappear. I hear a door squeak and turn to see who it is. I see not a who, but a what. A dog with a pointed nose stands a few yards away from me. It crouches low and creeps towards me, its lips peeling back from its white teeth. A growl gurgles from deep in its throat and I see why the cheese would have come in handy. Or the knife, but it's too late now. 
I think about running, but the dog would be faster than me. I can't wrestle it to the ground. My head pounds. That's my cuckoo clock. I'll just let it finish. Matt, can you please edit that bit out? think about running, but the dog will be faster than me. I can't wrestle it to the ground, my head pounds. I have to make a decision. If I can jump over one of the tables and use it as a shield, no, I'm too short to jump the tables and use it as a shield, the dog snarls and I can almost feel the sound vibrating in my skull. My biology textbook said that dogs can smell fear because of the chemicals secreted by human glands in a state of duress, the same chemical a dog's prey secretes. Smelling fear leads them to attack. The dog inches forward towards me, its nails scraping the floor. I can't run, I can't fight. Instead, I breathe in the smell of the dog's foul breath and try not to think about what it just ate. There were no whites in its eyes, just a black gleam. What else do I know about dogs? I shouldn't look in its eyes. That's a sign of aggression. I remember asking my father for a pet dog when I was young. And now, staring at the ground in front of the dog's paws, I can't remember why. It comes closer, still growling. I'm staring into its eyes is a sign of aggression. What's the sign of submission? My breaths are loud but steady. I sink to my knees. The last thing I want to do is lie on the ground in front of a dog, making its teeth level with my face. It's the best option I have. I stretch my legs out before me and lean on my elbow. The dog creeps closer and closer until I feel its warm breath on my face. My arms are shaking. It barks in my ear and I clench my teeth and keep from screaming. Something rough and wet touches my cheek. The dog's growling stops and I lift up my head to look at it again. It's panting. It licked my face. I frown and sit on my heels. The dog props its paws up from my knees. The dog props its paws up on my knees and licks my chin. I cringe, wiping the drool from my skin and laugh. You're not such a vicious beast, huh? I get up slowly so I don't startle it but it seems like a different animal than the one that was fo that faced me a few seconds ago. I stretch out a hand carefully so I can draw it back. If I need to. The dog nudges my hand with its head. I'm suddenly glad I didn't pick up the knife. I blink and when I open my eyes, a child sits across the room wearing a white dress and she stretches out both, both hands and screams, Puppy! As she runs towards the dog at my side, I open my mouth to warn her, but too late. The dog turns. Instead of growling, it barks and snarls and snaps, and its muscles hunch up like a coiled wire. About to pan pounce, I don't think. I just jump. I hurl my body on top of the dog, wrapping my arms around its thick neck. My head hits the ground. The dog's gone. And so is the little girl. Instead, I'm alone in the testing room, now empty. I turn in a slow circle and I can't see myself in any of the mirrors. I push the door open and walk into the hallway. But it isn't a hallway, it's a bus and all the seats are taken. I stand in the aisle and hold on to the pole. Sitting near to me is a man with a newspaper. I can't see his face over the top, but I can see his hands. They're scarred, like he was burned, and they clutch around the paper, like he wants to crumple it. Do you know this guy? he asks. He taps the picture on the front page of the newspaper. The headline reads, Br Brutal murderer finally apprehended. I stare at the word murderer. It's been a long time since I've read that word. But even its shape fills me with dread. In the picture beneath the headline is a young man with a plain face and a beard. I feel like I do know him though I don't remember how. And at the same time, I feel like it would be a bad idea to tell the man that 
Well, I hear his anger in his voice. Do you? A bad idea. No, a very bad idea. My heart pounds and I clutch the pole to keep my hands from shaking and giving me away. If I tell him I know the man from the article, something awful will happen to me. So I can convince him that I don't. I clear my throat and shrug my shoulders that that would be a lie. I clear my throat. Do you? He repeats. I shrug my shoulders. Well? A shudder goes through me. My fear is irrational. This is just a test. It isn't real. No. I say, my voice casual. No idea who he is. He stands and finally I see his face. He wears dark sunglasses and his mouth is bent in a snarl. His cheek is ripped with scars, like hands. He leans close to my face. His breath smells like cigarettes. Not real, I remind myself. Not real. You're lying, he says. You're lying. I'm not. I can see it in your eyes. I pull myself up straighter. You can't. If you know him, he says in a low voice, you could save me. You could save me. I narrow my eyes. Well, I can't. I don't. The end of chapter two. I'll see you tomorrow for chapter three. Chapter 3 Diversion. I wake up to sweaty palms and a pang of guilt in my chest. I'm lying in the chair in the mirrored room. When I tilt my head back, I see Tori behind me. She pinches her lips together and removes electrodes from our heads. I wait for her to say something about the test, that it's over, or that I did well. Although, how can I do poorly on a test like this? But she says nothing. She pulls the words from my forehead. I sit forward and wipe my palms off my slacks. I had to have had to have done something wrong, even if it only happened in my mind. Is that a strange look on Tori's face? Because she doesn't know how to tell me what a terrible person I am. I wish she could just come out with it. That, she said, was perplexing. Excuse me. I'll be right back. Next thing. I bring my knees to my chest and bury my face in them. I wish I felt like crying because the tears might bring a sense of relief, but they don't. How can you fail a test you aren't allowed to prepare for? As the moments pass, I get more nervous. I have to wipe my hands every few seconds as the sweat collects, or maybe, I just do it because it helps me feel calmer. What if they tell me that I'm not cut out for any faction? I would have to live on the streets with the factionless. I can't do that. To live factionless is not just to live in poverty and discomfort. It's to live divorced from society, separating from the most important thing in life, community. My mother once told me that we can't survive alone. Even if we could, we wouldn't want to. Without a faction, you have no purpose and no reason to live. I shake my head. I can't think like this. I have to stay calm. Finally, the door opens and Tori walks back in. I grip the arms of the chair. Sorry to worry you, she says. She stands by my feet with her hands in her pocket. She looks tense and pale. Beatrice, your results were... Inconclusive, she says. Typically, each stage of the simulation eliminates one or more of the factions, but in your case, only two have been ruled out. I stare at her. Two? I ask. My throat is so tight it's hard to talk. If you'd shown an automatic distaste for the knife and selected the cheese, the simulation would have led you to a different scenario and confirmed your aptitude for amnesty. That didn't happen, which is why Amity is out. Tori scratches the back of her neck. Normally, the simulation progresses in a linear fashion, isolating one faction by ruling out the rest. 
The choices you made didn't allow Candor, the next possibility, to be ruled out. So I had to alter the simulation to put you on the bus. And there, your insistence upon dishonesty ruled out Candor. She half smiles. Don't worry about that. Only the candle tell the truth in that one. One of the knots in your te chest loosens. Might be not an awful person. I suppose that's not entirely true. People who tell the truth are candor and the abnegation, she says, which gives us a problem. My mouth falls open. On the one hand, you threw yourself on the dog rather than let, let it attack the little girl, which is an abnegation oriented response. But on the other hand, when the man told you that the truth would save him, you still refused to tell it. Not an abnegation oriented response at all, she sighs. Not running from the dog suggests dauntless, but so does taking the knife, which you didn't do. She clears her throat and continues. Your intelligent response to the dog indicates strong alignment with the erudite. I have no idea what to make of your indecision in stage one, but... Wait, I interrupt her. So you have no idea what my aptitude is? Yes and no. My conclusion, she explains, is that you display equal aptitude for abnegation, dauntless and erudite. People who get this kind of result are... She looks over her shoulder like she expects someone to appear behind her. They're called divergent. She says the last word so quietly that I almost don't hear. And her tense, worried look returns. She walks around the side of the chair and leans in close to me. Beatrix, she says, under no circumstances should you share that information with anyone. This is very important. We aren't supposed to share our results or not. I know that. No, Tori kneels next to me, the chair now. Kneels next to the chair now and places her arms on the armrest. Our faces are inches apart. This is different. I don't mean you shouldn't share them now. I mean you should never share them with anyone, even, ever, no matter what happens. Divergent. Divergence is extremely dangerous. You understand? I don't understand. How could inconclusive test results be dangerous? But I'm not. I don't want to share my test results with anyone anyway. Okay, I peel my hands from the arms of the chair and stand. I feel unsteady. I suggest, Tori says, that you go home, you have a lot of thinking to do, and waiting with others may not benefit you. I have to tell my brother where I'm going. <laughs> I'll let him know. I touch my forehead and stare at the floor as I walk out of the room. I can't bear to look him in the eye. I can't bear to think about the choosing ceremony tomorrow. It's my choice no matter what the test says. Abnegation, dauntless, erudite, divergent. I decide not to take the bus. If I get home early, my father will notice when he checks the house log at the end of the day and I have to explain what happened. Instead, I walk. I'll have to interrupt Caleb before he mentions anything to our parents. But Caleb can keep a secret. I walk in the middle of the road. The buses tend to hug the curb so it's safer. Sometimes on the street near my house. I can see places where yellow lines used to be. We have no use for them now, there are few cars, we don't need spotlights either, but in some places they dangle precariously over the road, like they might crash down any time. Renovation moves slowly through the city, which is a patchwork of new, clean buildings and old, crumbling ones. Most of the new buildings are next to the march, which, is, which used to be a lake a long time ago. The Abnegation Voluntary Agency my mother works for is responsible for most of those renovations. When I look at the Abnegation lifestyle as an outsider, I think it's beautiful. 
When I watch my family move in harmony, when we go to dinner parties and everyone cleans together without having to be asked, when I see Caleb have strangers carry their groceries, I fall in love with this life all over again. It's only when I try and live it myself, I have trouble. It never feels genuine. But choosing a different faction means I forsake my family permanently. Just past the abnegation sector of the city is the stretch of buildings, skeletons and broken sidewalks that I now walk through. There are places where the road has completely collapsed, revealing sewer systems and empty subways that I have to be careful to avoid, and places that stink so powerfully of sewage and trash I have to flip my nose. This is where the factionless live. Because they fail to complete initiation in whatever faction they choose, they live in poverty, doing the work no one else wants to do. They're the janitors and construction workers and garbage collectors. They make fabric and operate trains and drive buses. In return for their work, they get food and clothing. But as my mother says, it's, that's not enough of that either. I see a factionless man standing up on the corner ahead. He wears ragged brown clothing and skin sags from his jaw. He stares at me and I stare back at him, unable to look away. Excuse me, he says in a raspy voice. Do you have something I can eat? I feel a lump in my throat. A stern voice in my head says, duck your head and keep walking. No, I shake my head. I shouldn't be afraid of this man. He needs help and I'm supposed to help him. Uh, yeah, I say. I reach into my bag. My father tells me to keep food in my bag at all times for exactly this reason. I offer the man a bag of dried apple slices. He reaches for them, but instead of taking the bag, he closes his hands around my wrist. He smiles at me as it has a gap in his front teeth. Mono, don't you have pretty eyes, he says. It's a shame the rest of you's plain. My heart pounds. I took my bag back, but his grip tightens. I smell something acrid and unpleasant on his breath. You look a little young to be walking around by yourself, he says. I stop tugging and stand up straighter. I know I look young. I don't need to be reminded of that. I'm older than I look. He's 16. His lips spread wide, revealing a grey molar with a dark pit in the side. I can't tell if he's smiling or grimacing. This isn't to, then isn't today a special day for you, the day before you choose. Let go of me, I say. I hear ringing in my ears. My voice sounds clear and stern. Not what I expect to hear. I feel like it doesn't belong to me. I'm ready. I know what to do. I picture myself bringing my elbow back and hitting him. I see the bag of apples flying away from me. I hear my running footsteps. I'm prepared to act. But then he releases my wrist takes the apple and says, choose wisely, little girl. Join me tomorrow for chapter four. Divergent, chapter four. I reach my street five minutes before I usually do, according to my watch which is the only adornment abnegation allows and only because it's practical. It is a grey hand and a glass face. If I tilt it right, I can almost see my reflection over the hands. The houses of my street are all the same size and shape. They are made of grey cement with few windows in econom economical, no nonsense rectangles. Their lawns are crab grass and their mailboxes are dull metal. To some the slight to some the side might be gloomy, but to me their simplicity is comforting. The reason for the simplicity isn't disdain for uniqueness, as the other factions have sometimes interpreted it. Everything, our houses, our clothes, our hairstyles is meant to help us forget ourselves and protect us from vanity, greed and envy, which are just forms of selfishness. If we have little and want for little and we are all equal, we envy no one. I try to love it. I sit on the front step and wait for Caleb to arrive. 
and it doesn't take long. After a minute, I see a grey robed form walking down the street. I hear laughter. At school, we try not to draw attention to ourselves, but once we're home, the game and jokes start. My natural tendency towards sarcasm is still not appreciated. Sarcasm is always at someone's expense. Maybe it's better that abnegation wants to suppress me. Maybe I don't have to leave my family. Maybe if I fight to make abnegation work, my act will turn into reality. Beatrice, Caleb says, what happened? Are you all right? <clears throat> I'm fine. He's with Susan and her brother Robert, and Susan is giving me a strange look, like I'm a different person, that the one she knew this morning. I shrug. Oh, when the test was over, I got sick. It must have been that liquid they gave us. I feel better now, though. I tried to smile convincingly. I seem to have persuaded Susan and Robert, who no longer look concerned for my mental stability, but Caleb narrows his eyes at me the way he does when he suspects I'm lying. Did you two take the bus today, I ask? I don't care how Susan and Robert got home from school, but I need to change the subject. Our father had to work late, said Susan, and he told us we should spend some time thinking before the ceremony tomorrow. My heart pounds at the mention of the ceremony. You're welcome to come over later if you like, Caleb, asks politely. Thank you, smiles Susan at Caleb. Robert raises an eyebrow at me. He and I have been exchanging looks for the past year as Susan and Caleb flirt in the tentative way known only to abnegation. Caleb's eyes follow Susan down the street. I have to grab his arms to startle him from his days. I lead him into the house and close the door behind us. He turns to me. His dark straight eyebrows draw together so that the creases appear between them. When he frowns, he looks more like my mother than my father. In an instant, I can see him living the same kind of life my father did, staying in abnegation, learning a trade, marrying Susan and having a family. It would be wonderful. I may not see it. Are you going to tell me the truth now, he says softly. The truth is, I say, I'm not supposed to discuss it. And you're not supposed to ask. All those rules you bend, you can't bend this one. Not even for something this important. His eyebrows tug together as he bites the corner of his lip. Though his words are accustomed it sounds like he's probing me more for more information, like he actually wants an answer. I narrow my eyes. Will you? What happened in your test then, Caleb? Our eyes meet. I hear a train horn, so faint it could easily be the wind whistling through an alleyway. But I know, but I know it when I hear it. It sounds like the dauntless calling me to them. Just don't tell our parents what happened today, okay? I said, his eyes stay on mine for a few seconds and then he nods. I want to go down upstairs and lie down. The test, the walk and my encounter with the factionless man exhausted me. But my brother made breakfast this morning and my mother prepared our lunches and my father made dinner last night so it's my turn to cook. I breathe deeply and walk into the kitchen to start cooking. A minute later, Caleb joins me. I grip my teeth. He helps with everything. Which irritates me about... Which most irritates me about him is his natural goodness, his inborn selflessness. Caleb and I work together without speaking. I cook peas on the stove. He did frost four pieces of chicken. Most of what we eat is frozen or canned because farms these days are too far away. My mother told me once, a long time ago, that there were people who wouldn't buy genetically engineered produce because they viewed it as unnatural. Now we have no other option. By the time my parents get home, dinner is ready and the table is set. My father drops his bag onto the door and kisses my head. Other people see him as an opinionated man, too opinionated maybe, but he's also loving. I try to see only the good in him, I try. 
I'm with the Tesco today, he asked me. I pull the peas into the serving bowl. Fine, I say. I couldn't be candor, I lied too easily. I heard there was some kind of upset with one of the tests, my mother said. Like my father, she works for the government, but she manages city improvement projects. She recruited volunteers to administer the aptitude test. Most of the time, though, she organises workers to help the factionless with food and shelter and job opportunities. Really? said my father. A problem with the aptitude tests are rare. I don't know much about it, but my friend Erin told me that something went wrong with one of the tests, so the re results have to be reported verbally. My mother places a napkin next to me on the table. Apparently, the student got sick and was sent home early. My mother shrugs. I hope they're all right. Did you two hear about that? No, Caleb says and smiles at his mother. My brother couldn't be candor either. We sat at the table where you always pass food to the right and no one eats until everyone is served. My father extends his hands to my mother and my brother and they extend their hands to him and me. And my father gives thanks to God for food and work and friends and family. Not every abnegation family is religious, but my father says we should try not to see those differences because they will only drive us apart. I'm not sure what to make of that. So, my mother says to my father, tell me. She takes my father's hand and moves his thumb in a small circle over in the course. I stare at their joined hands. My parents love each other, but they rarely show affection in front of us. They've taught us that physical contact is powerful, so I have to be wary of it since I'm young. Tell me what's bothering you, she adds. I stare at my plate. My mother's acute senses sometimes surprise me, but now they child me. Why was I so focused on myself that I didn't notice the deep frown and his sagging posture? I had a difficult work at day, he said. Well, really, it was Marcus who had a difficult day. I shouldn't lay claim to it. Marcus is my father's co-worker. They're both political leaders. The city is ruled by a council of 50 people composed entirely of representatives from abnegation. Because our fraction is regarded as incorruptible due to our commitment to selflessness, our leaders are selected by their peers for their impeccable character, moral fortitude and leadership skills. Representatives from each of the other factions can speak in a meeting on behalf of of a particular issue, but ultimately the decision is the council's. And while the council technically makes decisions together, Marcus is particularly influ influential. It's been that way since the beginning of the Great Peace, when the factionless factions were formed. I think the system persists because we're afraid of what might happen if it didn't war. Yeah. Is that about the report Jenny Matthews released, my mother says. Jenny Matthews is Erudite's sole representative selected based on her IQ score. My mother complains about her often. I look up a report. Caleb gives me a warning look. We aren't supposed to speak at the dinner table unless our parents ask a, di a direct question. And they usually don't. Our listening ears are a gift to them, my father says. They give us their listening is after dinner in the family room. Yes, my father says, his eyes now own. The arrogant, self-righteous, he stops and clears his throat, sorry. But she released a report attacking Marcus's character. I raised my eyebrows. What did it say? I ask. Beatrice, Caleb says. I duck my head, turning my fork over and over and over until the warmth leaves my cheeks. I don't like to be I don't like to be chastised, especially by my brother. It's said, my father says, that Marcus's violence and cruelty towards his son is the reason his son chose dauntless instead of abnegation. Few people are born into abnegation choose to leave it. When they do, we remember. Two years ago Marcus's son Tobias left us for the dauntless, and Marcus was devastated. 
Tobias was his only child and his only family since his wife died giving birth to their second child. The infant died a few minutes later. I never met Tobias. He rarely attended community events and never joined his father at our house for dinner. My father often remarked that it was strange, but now it doesn't matter. Cruel, Marcus, my mother shakes her head. That poor man, as if he needs to be reminded of his loss. Of his son's betrayal, you mean, my father says coldly. I shouldn't be surprised at this point. The erudite have been attacking us with their reports for months. And this isn't the end. There will be more, I guarantee it. I speak again, but I can't help myself. I blurt out, what are they going, why are they doing this? Why don't you take this opportunity to listen to your father, Beatrice, my mother says gently. It's phrased like a suggestion, not a command. I look across at the table at Caleb, who has a look, has a look of disapproval in his eyes. I stare at my peas. I'm not sure I can live this life of obligation any longer. I'm not good enough. You know why, my father says, because we have something they want. Vaulting knowledge above all else results in a lust for power and that leads men into dark and empty places. You should be thankful that we know better. I nod, I know, I will choose erudite. Even though my test suggests that I could and I'm my father's daughter. My parents clean up after dinner. They don't even let Caleb help them because we're supposed to keep ourselves tonight instead of to keep us, ourselves to ourselves tonight instead of gathering in family room so we can think about our results. My family might be able to help me choose if I could talk about my results, but I can't. Tori's warning whispers in my memory every time my resolve to keep my mouth shut falters. Caleb and I climb the stairs and at the top, when we divide to go to our separate room, he stops me with a hand on my shoulder. Beatrice, he says, looking into my eyes. We should think about our family. There is an edge to his voice, but but we must also think for our think of ourselves. For a moment I stare at him. I've never seen him think of himself, never heard him insist on anything but selflessness. I'm so startled by his comment that I just say what I'm supposed to say. The tests don't change our choices. He smiles a little. Don't they though? He squeezes my shoulder and walks into his bedroom. I peer into his room and see an unmade bed and a stack of books on his desk. He closes the door. I wish I could tell him we were going through the same thing. I wish I could speak to him like I want to instead of like I'm supposed to. But the idea of admit admitting I need help is too much to bear, so I turn away. I walk into my room and when I close my door behind me, I realise that the decision might be simple. It might require a great act of selflessness to choose abnegation, or it might a great act of courage to choose dauntless, and maybe just choosing one over the other will prove that I belong. Tomorrow these two qualities will struggle within me, and only one can win. Join me next time for chapter 5.